what is what is predictive analytics? Um, one of the places where it's most used or most useful is in product. Um, <coughs> within the product realm, when you're trying to uh, do a product adoption uh, or launch a campaign in product adoption, and you want to improve your product adoption, you want to figure out your next best product to uh, upsell your customers in. And uh, you want to, for example, increase your online conversions, stuff like that. It's, that's where one of the most powerful applications of predictive analytics, where you try to understand what it is that are the drivers of that app, the behavior you're expecting or you're wanting the, uh, the customers to do, for example, conversion. Better conversion, better, better profitability, and so on. The other area which it is uh, most useful, and we've seen a big application, is marketing. Marketing is now, in, in some cases, more mature. Uh, in its use of predictive analytics. You've all heard of response model. You've probably all heard of these, uh, you know, increasing the market to universe, lookalike, cloning. All these are in the space of marketing analytics. And again, very powerful. <coughs> and I would say if, if predictive analytics is mature anywhere, it's in the, it's in the marketing realm. Very well, good utilization. Um, and then there's the other aspect of customer experience which is, you know, your customer is churning for a reason, or there are drivers that are leading for customers to churn, or some ways of, uh, even if you were to apply the customer experience to, let's say, conversion, some way where the experience is getting, um, is not, um, there's a bad, bad experience for your customer. That can be a place where um, you can use the driver analysis to find those, uh, you know, golden, golden nuggets. Of, what's, what's driving this? What is causing uh, the folks to churn? Not causing, what is correlated with the, with the, with the customer's churn? And then do a test and learn for establishing coverage. So what is critical analytics? Uh, it's a technique, a uh, statistical technique to analyze. You look at your past data, and this is just an example. You look at your past data to in, 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 through some ways of uh, you know, through some lenses of looking at uh, historical data, and from that you predict your future. Data. That's in the simple way that is what a predictive model is. So there's a there's a sales data here, uh, and based on some uh, heuristics on this sales data, this sales data you're predicting uh, the actual sales. The one most common example is is in our real life example is uh, FICO scores, right? We all have FICO scores. That's an example of. Uh, that's the most common example which we see that that's actually a, a, a model, it's an output of a predictive model that we all have a FICO score, lower, higher, and somebody has built some algorithm which says, you know, if, you, if they have defaulted or if they have X, Y, Z, some, some rules behind it, that you'll have a, a FICO score of X versus Y. It's a competition. So that's a very common example of FICO score, uh, like the predictive analytics. Is it okay if I stand here? Mm -hmm. Is it able to, you not able to? Yeah, sorry. I can move. No, no, that's fine. I'm going to try to stand uh, this works. Oh, this works? No? Just in a second. I'll be fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So it looks very too much. Okay. Um, so there are two, they are, they are, in terms of predictive analytics, it's a huge and wide, um, Field. So there are three techniques which are most commonly used in the industry. One is regression, which is a continuous target. You know, you have um, you've heard of customer lifetime value. Uh, you've heard of cost of acquisition is predicted before going into a launch. Those are uh, using techniques called linear regression, where your target, the what you are modeling, is a continuous curve. <coughs> There's uh, another category which is another very powerful uh, set of techniques in classification where your target is discrete. This will happen or not. Response, for example. Respond, this person will, the customer will respond or not. The 0, 01 or 0, 012. It's, it's some kind of discrete uh, target that you're trying to model. And for those, uh, there are two techniques which are decision tree and logistic regression. We'll go into a little bit of detail into that. But before we go into that, the details of the techniques. Let's talk about termino terminologies a little bit. Uh, because I think this is, the, this is what you hear when you talk to um, folks who are building models. You hear the, these terminologies and it kind of helps if you have understand what they're talking about. So there's a concept of dependent variable. Dependent variable is essentially the target. The, 
for example, res response ratio, FICO, whatever it is that you are trying to predict. That's your dependent variable. Your independent variables are what you hypothesize that may have relationship with your um, dependent variable. Right? And so these, uh, when, you're look, when you're looking at independent, this is a hypothesis. They may not prove to have a relationship or not. Right? For example, um, your marketing dollars at, uh, up to a certain point have some correlation with your revenue. Right? The more marketing dollars you can pump in, you may have, uh, uh, you, know, you have some relationship with the marketing, uh, with the revenue, right? So, so if this is your revenue and this is your marketing dollar, at, uh, up to a certain point there is some relationship. So there is, uh, I mean, if I, if I plan, not as bad, but at some point, but this is, this is looking at, uh, looking at revenue and saying, this revenue might be, when you have established a variable to be have a relationship independent, then it becomes a predictor. Otherwise, it's an independent. You have hypothesis that you may have a relationship, so it's called independent variables. That's when you are going into a model building. There's also this concept of time window. What you're trying to do essentially at this point is, it's a prediction, right? So you you're usually saying, this is my current value, current state, P1. I want to predict value as of a, as a, as of a future time, just T2. <coughs> three months in advance, six months in advance, five years in advance, I've seen all sorts of models, right? So the independent variable, all those variables which you are going to look at to make predictions as of your future time is, so that those are independent variables at T1. And your dependent variable is as of T2. And this then becomes your prediction window. <coughs> and also there is a there's a there's another concept of observation window, which is before you can even qualify your sample size to be in the your predictive model, you usually have a qualification of you should have met this bar. And the reason you do that is because you you let's say you were doing a, a customer churn model, right? And uh, you took all the people, all your customers at, a, at point T1, and you started looking at their attributes. Some people may have joined your company or they may have sub sub subscribed to your product between T0 and T1. You were going to compare them with people who have been with you for years. So some kind of normalization is needed. So you can say, I'm going to take this customer who at least would have done something by T0. Right? And that's your qualification, sample qualification. So this is your observation window, this is your future window. So dependent, independent, and once they approve, predictor. Often in the industry or in the examples when you're going to attend recommend this word, these words are interchangeably used. Uh, they're, going to use they're going to call it independent, but they may, may need predictor versus. So that's a little fuzzy, but that's um, what you roughly use. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Bro? Correlation. So correlation is uh, it's a measure of linear relationship between two variables. So, if, um, if for example, between that time window, if I say revenue has some linear relationship with marketing dollar I spend, then I'm going to use a measure called Pearson coefficient, or um, a small r or big r square, to un understand, to quantify that measure of how, how well they are correlated, how well they are linearly correlated. Right? So when they have no correlation, for example, here sales over time, it's all over the place. There's no nothing happening to my sales as a function of time, and so there's a there's no correlation here. Right? You may see a positive correlation. My sales is over going you know is is going in a positive direction. It's increasing over time. So that's a positive correlation. And uh, you may have negative correlation by some reason. That example, but some reason sales is going, you know, down south over time. So, you know, and you you basically the value of r square is between plus one and minus one. Plus one means it's a hundred percent correlation. Minus positive correlation. Minus one means it's a hundred percent negative correlation. If this happens, this definitely does not happen. So, uh, we did talk about sampling somewhat in the testing frame. Uh, testing uh, framework. It's a similar concept here where you never build a predictor model on your population. You build it in a sample, right? Because it's faster, you can collect data quickly, uh, and also if you are going to take action on them, 
most of the time, if you select a good sample, you can you'll be able to project it out to your population. So the only thing to know about two things to know about sample sampling is sampling should be random and should be well representative of the population. So for example, let's say I have a population and uh, it has 52% male and 48% female, right? If this aspect of my sample, whatever sample I create, first it has to be large enough, it should have roughly that same ratio as in the population. And demographically you may be good, but a lot of times what you get, when you get into it is your population, your, uh, for example, your product adoption. That may start varying and, and it may be a smaller percentage. So it's very important to do, make sure that whatever those important segments are, your sample is representing the population the same way. The other thing which is most important is, let's say you have, you're, uh, you're building a churn model, right? And you have 10% churn in your population. When you do a sample collection, you should have roughly the same percentage of churn in your sample, right? Because that's a true representation. And a, a, a lot of places when I see failures, that's when the proper, proper sample was not taken. And somehow there's a bias and the sample has somehow caught up, caught more churners. And thereby, whatever findings you may have in your sample population, in your model, may not hold for the population. Right, so the sampling is a very important concept um, in, in the critical analysis. So how many of you guys have uh, seen this kind of curve, lift curve? Some few, right? A lot of times when people are showing, if they're showcasing uh, a model, they'll, uh, they'll show a curve like this, a lift curve. And uh, it's important to understand what it means. So it's, it is useful to evaluate a goodness of it. How good is my model? You use one of the uh, attributes, one of the uh, you know, uh, evaluation method you use is lift curve. And what this means is, essentially, the blue line is saying, this is my random baseline population. If there was no model, and my churn rate is 10%, if I were to take 10% or, let's say, 30% of my population, I will capture 30% of my churners. Right? There's no model. It's all completely random. You take 30% of the population, you will capture 30% of those churners, right? If you have a good model or a model which is giving you some lift, what happens is with the 30% of the population now, you are able to capture like 70% of the positive responses, which is you what you have a population, you have your uh, uh, your model is able to score your population. And if you start going from the highest percent, let's say in this case it's a responder, response rate, highest response to lowest response rate, by the time you choose 30%, top 30%, you're already capturing 70% of your responses. So, so that means, go ahead. So basically that's like with 30% of your customers, that's that's the same as if you were to get 70% of the customers without a model. Exactly, exactly. So you're, you're having to reach out to less, mm -hmm. um, and you're still getting the same response. And that's the that's the advantage of using a using a model. What is that in terms of? But this it, it seems counterintuitive in terms of does that skew your.